When I was six years old, I used to sit in the back of my dad's Cortina with a hanger and drive, pretending that hanger to be a steering wheel. By the time I was 14, I realized that I had an obsession with speed. I bought myself a car, and that was it. I haven't looked back. Now I'm going to race and rally across the world. <laughs> Meet legends. You always like speed. Could never get enough. Professional drivers. It is like a drug, and you want to do more. People obsessed with speed. Like me. Now I don't know what your title is over there. King of speed, bruv. King of speed. Where's the ejector button? I've wanted to eject out of these things every now and then. So far, I've seen how the US has irrevocably shaped the cars we drive. I put my finger on the moment that cars went from things that got us from A to B to machines of speed and beauty. And I've seen the darker side of racing. The underground scene, the drag racing, the kids love it. How those who broke the law created America's most popular motorsport. Coming up. John Cooper put a little Formula Junior engine in it, and that was the Mini Cooper. I'm exploring the mysterious world of underground street racing. Cannibal was started to say, speed limits? We don't need no stinking speed limits. It was a protest against the 55. I'm going to see how we race road cars all over the world. Well, you know, they might be racing five, six thousand miles a From East London to Japan. Nice. <laughs> and I'll try to understand why we're willing to break the law to drive fast. Do you like speed? I'm trying to avoid it because I've got 11 points at the moment, so... <laughs> 11 points. Mum, I'm OK. All right, don't worry about this. I'm in London, and it's back to the day job. The premiere for a film I made called Mandela, a Long Walk to Freedom. It's a welcome break from crammed cars and racetracks. I'm back on a mission. Well, sort of. I'm about to have a go in the ultimate motor. Built to order from a chateau in France, the Bugatti Veyron became the world's fastest production car in 2006. Rumor has it there are less than a dozen in the UK. And Afzal Khan owns this one. So what's interesting about it is that it's like it's really eye-catching. Like literally everybody's looking at it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a statement, isn't it? A Bugatti's it's stunned on its own. And it's, it's totally a, a unique car. So you know, if you've got a Ferrari, you've got a, you've got a Lamborghini. You see plenty of Ferraris and Lamborghinis, but you don't see these things. Yeah. So I mean, you you don't strike me as a poser. I, I have a I love cars, right. and if you love cars, you've got to have one of these in life. Yeah. Got yeah. to have. But I do my fair share of posing, though. <laughs> Doing bespoke work on cars was a hobby, which turned into a business. So back in the early days, I started off working on Ford Capris and Ford Mark V Cortinas really? and, and Mark, es Mark II Escorts and putting forest arches on so, them and putting so, fancy wheels on them. Do, do you remember gear? Yeah, of course so, I do. So you're yeah, like yeah. A, a, a bespoke gear. Yeah, I'm a bit like a gear or Pininfarini. Yeah, you know, right. my, my sort of passion is in, in life is to go follow the sort of roots of Pininfarini. We're actually more of a design house than what you call a, a customised house. Right. Did you ever redesign any Datsuns? I started my life on a, off in the Datsun. <laughs> <laughs> that was my stepping stone for my business. A Datsun? I sold it for £600 and I opened my first business of 600 pounds. Wow. That was the Datsun that helped me get there. Khan, how, how, how much is this car worth? Well, they cost brand new just over uh, 1.2, 1.3 million pounds. So, um, wow. This you can't put a value on because it's got my registration number on it. So if you looked at the whole package, it'd probably be the most expensive Bugatti in the world. Really? Yeah. Do you know how many miles per gallon it does? I think, I believe it's about six miles per gallon. <laughs> With its F1 number plate attached, it would probably set you back a cool seven million quid. Its V16 quad turbo, eight liter engine puts out over a thousand brake horsepower, meaning that driving it, even at 20 miles an hour, 
is quite an experience. Can you can you sort of define like what is it about fast cars that you personally like? I mean, can you can you pinpoint it? I think it's more towards design and, and the way it's been engineered and how it's been made and how it's been put together. Well, the, the top speed on this is 253 miles an hour. What? Yeah, and and you, if you probably noticed, there's no exhaust sound. Yeah. So it's, it sounds it's, more know, like it's an aeroplane. It's, it's an aeroplane. It's, it's the sound of a jet. Do you like speed? Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I do like speed. But, um, I'm trying to avoid it because I've got 11 points at the moment. So, <laughs> 11 points. Yeah, for speeding. Yeah. What? No wonder. Mm, not good. And as beautiful and as fast as this car is, Verons are too precious to have real fun with. Down the road in East London, I've come to watch some local lads drive sideways. What they're doing is drifting. Oh, man, I tell you, man, I could do that with my Matchbox cars when I was a kid, but I can't do that in that. I've been driving since I was 14 years old, you know, not many people have, you know what I mean? Like, I, and I'm talking about mid-80s when I was, a, I was a kid. And I jump into a, a car, I hardly know how to move it, but at some point, you know, all the experience of sitting there in the back seat watching my mum and dad or my dad drive became my knowledge of driving, and it started into this fascination with speed. This lot have been given permission to use this land. In other parts of the country, drifters use any bit of road they can find and not always legally. Driving illegally has created motorsports all around the world, you know what I mean? You know, I think it's part of this massive connection between man and motor car. We made the motor car, we invented the wheel, but here we are now figuring out new ways to take that to a new level, to a, to a thrill ride. You know, until we make a car that is as fast as a jet plane and the jet plane is as fast as a rocket, how can we ever satisfy what it are? fascination with speed is, you know, I think it's just that, that continuous exploration of it all. You know, I'm 41 now and I'm still, still want to get into more cars, still haven't driven enough, you know. <laughs> Learning how to do this might help with my cornering. Drifting is one of Europe's fastest growing motorsports. It was actually developed on the winding roads of Japan. The idea is that you get the car into a sideways drift and you were marked on control, technique and style. A bit like ice skating. In top competitions, drivers can win up to $25,000 for a perfectly executed drift at 100 miles per hour. In the last decade, drifting has exploded in the UK, and a former British champion is Steve Baggioni. When I started five, six years ago, the understanding of drifting wasn't that big, so when you tried to talk to um, a track to explain what you wanted to do, they, they didn't really grasp it, so they kind of didn't, under so didn't understand it, so you had to start on the street. I started driving on the streets of Essex around roundabouts, but. You know, and kids and what, kids drifting yeah, around about. Of course, yeah, kids kids still do it. I mean, where I live, fortunately, um, I live on a crossroads of like three police forces, so it's like cat and mouse. So the kids will go out, and there'll be one minute in the Essex police force on a roundabout, sort of tearing that up, and then they'll see the police, so they'll move to the Met area. So uh, then the Met will be on to them. I mean, if you get pinched by the police, what what do they pinch you for? Illegal oh, driving? Yeah, of course, dangerous driving, reckless driving. You know, driving without due care and attention. You know, it's really something you don't want to do if you're looking to get into this sport, you know. Do they even recognise it as drifting? Yeah, they figured it out now, yeah. <laughs> Officer, I'm just drifting, man. Yeah, it's a that. legal sport. You admit that to a policeman there, you're in, you're, in, you're, in, you're in trouble right there. Yeah, it's not good. So go in at second, yeah? Yeah, I'd try going in a second and then basically kind of throw it and kick the clutch and keep the power in and try and turn. In all seriousness, I wouldn't recommend anyone drifting anywhere other than a racetrack. See, it's just on that point of where, you see those tyres are starting to screech and you feel the car starting to go, it's that next point of where the car breaks traction and starts to slide. Right. Learning how to drift is a great way to improve my cornering skills, but it's not easy. Don't lift. Don't lift. Don't lift. Bang the clutch. 
That's it, it's coming, turn. Right, this is good. <laughs> this is good because we know we now are getting the car to brake traction. Yeah. All we've got to do is kind of move you over to the middle of the track right. and control it as it comes around a little bit more. Okay. But other than that, this is progress. Getting it. This is progress. <laughs> That was good. And again, that's it. So I want you to show me some more, brother. No worries, I'll give it a go. See what we can do. I'm starting to realise why many describe this as an art form. And like all the great disciplines, this one has a grand master. This is Kichi Tashui. It was in the 70s that Kichi pioneered a unique way of pushing the limits of a Japanese hatchback. And drifting was born. みんな同じところでブレーキングしていくんだけど、なかなかこう抜けないんで、ドリフトを入れたらそのノーブレーキで入っていって、その後はドリフトをすればいいっていうレースに取り入れたのがドリフトです。Did you know that drifting was a sport or was it just for fun? 昨年まではアンダーグラウンド。今年からはJAF公認になって日本のまあFIAと同じものですけれども、それのドリフトが今年から。FIA公認として始まりました It's a really amazing uh, skill, what, what they can do there, you know, and like, <laughs> at one point I thought those two cars are going to collide and we're going to hit a pole and the airbags are going to smash me in the face. Something that started off in the mountains of Japan on those wicked slopes, influencing kids in Essex, those two sort of worlds coming together and making a sport out of it. Nice! Nice! <laughs> it's amazing how the urban landscape has created drifting. But the Japanese weren't the first to develop a motorsport based on their surroundings. Back in the 60s, a group of bikers assembled here at the Ace Cafe, where they planned a deadly bike race around the centre of London that would become a phenomenon. I'm here to meet Paul Dunstall, who was a key member of the movement. There were no speed limits, it's only in town with there a speed limit. The cafes are just incidental, really. It was just somewhere so we'd nip into Johnson's Cafe, perhaps have a cup of tea, but not for long, and we'd be outside on the sort of the, the out ramp onto the road, sitting there on our bikes, ticking over, ready to go, looking for a motorcycle to go by that looks like he might be, might be up, for, it. up for, a, for a race. 
<laughs> and, uh... It's boy racing, really, wasn't it? Yeah. It strikes me that the cafe racers wanted to experience the thrill of speed at all costs. The aim was to hit 100 miles per hour on the streets of London. It was known as the Tun Up, and those riders that managed it were legendary. Not many bikes would do that in those days. If you got a bike that did a ton, that was, that was quite something. But, it, I mean, that quickly moved on in, in what well, certainly in our circles, so that 120 became the... Then 125 became, you know, you needed to do. So by modifying a bit at a time, try this, try that... You made it Within into about a... a year, I mean, I'd got probably, if not the quickest, one of the quickest bikes for cafe racing in the south of the country. And... Other motorcyclists sort of got to hear about it and wanted to buy them. And um, it just went, grew and grew and grew. You had celebrities. Uh, I think Steve McQueen liked one of your bikes. Did he buy one? He did, yeah. He bought, um, it would be a, a 750 Dunstall Norton. Right. So, so that... Um, so it looked ordinary, but it was But fast. it went really quick, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Steve ordered one. And I think at the time we had about three or four month waiting lists, so he used to phone about once a week. But he was a Hollywood A-lister, surely he jumped up the list. No. <laughs> no, he was just... No. This is beautiful, though. It is beautiful. Really, really beautiful. Lovely job. It's fast. Oh, yes, it will be very fast off the mark. Very, yeah. When you see a bar like this, do you miss it a little bit? I do, that's very, that's a lovely bike. Yeah, that is, that's really nice. I mean, even if not to ride often, but to have it in the front entrance way, in your porch at home. In the 60s, bikes were cool and easy to afford. Hence, the closest thing we had to street racing were these guys. Across the Atlantic in the USA, it is a very different story. Over here, street racing means muscle cars with powerful engines. In Detroit, I met some underground racers. King of, king of street now. Now, I don't know what your title is over king there. King of speed, bruv. King of speed. Oh, king of the speed? Yeah. Speed versus street. That's what I'll I'm tell about. you what. Get your five cars and you leave whenever you want. Yeah. You got to explain that to him with that means. Five cars in front, and you leave whenever you want, and I'll start the car, but I'll come get you. Oh, come on, man. No way. Are you kidding me? I don't know what it's going to do. I'm at Raceway Park, New Jersey, the home of drag racing. I've come here to find out how street racing is behind the largest motorsport organization in the world. American street racing is simple. Two cars flat out over a quarter of a mile. The first past the post wins. The cars at this event were all built for the road, but they're anything but normal. Some have as much as 1,000 brake horsepower under the hood. It's no wonder that drag cars regularly make it into the record books. There they go. In the 50s, illegal street racing was out of control. By the end of the decade, it had killed dozens of drivers and spectators. A man called Wally Parts created the government-backed National Hot Rod Association to take racing off the streets. Here, they compete under strict rules designed for safety and fair play. Automatic expulsion faces any member who races on the public highways. As a result, the juvenile nuisance problem has been reduced as much as 90% in some communities. Tonight is a practice night where anyone can tune and test their cars. These rides are worth anything from a few thousand to a half a million dollars. They call this grudge racing, personal battles between racers, often with big money bets attached. Showing me around is Justin Humphreys, illegal street racer turned professional. This is something that, I mean, it happens everywhere. I mean, all local drag strips always have a test and tune night for people just to bring their stuff out, so. I want to race. I've got a coach. I want to use my coach to come race.
Betting on these guys is a serious business, so they ask the organizers to keep their practice times a secret. They can't show time on the board, because then the other one will know how fast they're going. So when they race each other, it won't be a competition if they race. It happens right here. The light comes down together, they line up, the light comes down together, and they get busy. They get busy. And the man to beat at the moment is this guy, Jason. They're gonna be racing for money, but they wanna check the cars out, make sure the cars go straight and everything. So, you know, they might be racing for five, six thousand dollars a piece. Word? Yeah. I, what's his fastest time? His fastest time? Well, it's grudge racing, so we can't tell the time. <laughs> you know? We street race, so we can't tell nobody the time. It's gonna be you know? eight, eight seconds somewhere, ain't it? Oh, no, way faster than that, though. What? Way faster than that. If we was in the eighth, we shouldn't even go out there. Wow. Yeah, way faster than that. It's really easy to see why racers spend their hard-earned cash on these cars. That's your boy right here. Yo, this is my man Jason. You know my man for the Y right here. What up, King? How you feeling? You all right? For them, yeah, it's a way of life. Up, They're dude? addicted right? to the competition and the banter that goes with it. See, this is an old-timer right here, Rebel. This is Green Regal. I better get some last week, though, about two weeks ago, though. Made a lot of money off it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true, man? Is that true? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Took him out. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's how you got to do it. Everybody was scared. Everybody was in the bushes. That's what we call in the bushes. You talking to, man. You ain't sexy enough for a movie, man. Leave it alone, man. You talking to him. This motherfucker talking to, man. You ain't sexy enough for a movie, man. Look, this fat girl right here, that's all the girls do is talk. You know what I'm saying? This is bringing back memories when I was hanging out as a kid, shouting about whose car was the fastest, but it never really got this serious. I mean, this is, it's common big, stuff. Big, big bragging. Oh, yeah. Big bragging. The mouths are always running. <laughs> Shit's always being talked. I mean, it's, uh, it's always going on. But that's why they love it, yeah. you know? That's what brings them out here Street every racing, week. love it. That's right. That's right. And like I said, these same guys will be here every time there's a test in I mean, they look forward to it. They go to work, and this is what they're waiting for. And after all that bragging, it's time to see Jason sling his car down the track. drug in the world is drag racing. Once you do it, you're hooked for life. And it's the most competitive motorsport in the world. Yeah. Uh, our class, 30 cars can show up at a race and they'll all run within five hundredths of a second. Yeah, but you, I think you've got a speed addiction yeah. that's worse than mine. Oh, it's, it's terrible. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily dangerous. I mean, this is the only track I've ever crashed at in my life. And I hit the wall at the finish line, 190, 200 mile an hour. And I was out of my phone on my cell phone talking to my pregnant wife before the EMTs even got to me. So, I mean, yeah, all motorsports are dangerous. Anything can happen at any time. Unfortunately, this racetrack is, is taking the lives of two of our top fuel drivers within the past four or five years. But, hey, it's the risk you take when you, when you go racing. Yeah. Monte Carlo Air According to some sources, drag racing has killed over 400 drivers since 1950. Even with rules and regulation, it's still extremely dangerous. It's no surprise that over the years we've attempted to balance the thrill of the car's raw power with our own safety. In the 60s, over 30,000 people a year were killed in road traffic accidents. The US government was soon under pressure to act. Cars like the Chevrolet Corvair were produced with anything but safety in mind. This great-looking motor was a death trap to anyone unlucky enough to crash in it. It wasn't long before a protest movement against the car emerged, led by a campaigner called Ralph Nader. If General Motors wishes to know why I spent an inordinate amount of time on the Corvair, it is because the Corvair is an inordinately dangerous vehicle. Nadar wanted to introduce safety tests and lower the interstate speed limits from 70 to 55. Talk of speed restrictions soon attracted major opposition from car enthusiasts. One man determined to prove Nadar wrong was Brock Yates. Now, Yates wanted to show that in the right hands, cars could be driven at speed and safely, so he created a protest event 
that became a global phenomenon. The Cannonball Run wasn't just a movie, it was an illegal street race that really happened. I'm meeting Brock's son, who accompanied him on that first race. You're Brock, right? Right. I'm Brock. Brock Jr.? I'm Brock Jr. And your dad started Cannonball Run. He started the Cannonball Run. He started the Cannonball Sea to Shining Sea Memorial Trophy Dash. What was the Cannonball about? What, I mean, what, what started it? I mean... Cannonball was started for two reasons. To prove that good drivers could traverse long distances at high speed safely. And the other one was an opportunity to say, Speed limits? We don't need no stinking speed limits. It was a protest against the 55. Remember, the, the West was empty. There was not a soul out there. Right. You'd leave St. Louis and you wouldn't see anybody else until California. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this, is this the car you This is the car. Yeah? This is the car. No, I didn't drive in. Brock, and, Brock, Brock ran it in 72 and 75. This is Can eight. you call him Dad, please? Because it just freaks me out when you uh, just say Brock. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My father got this car new, sent it down to Cotton Owens, NASCAR builder. And this was built specifically for the Cannonball. For a little extra range, there's a small fuel cell here. Wowzer. And when you went to a gas station, one pump went in there, one pump went in there, dollar bills flew across the floor. <laughs> I mean, this car was made for high speed driving. The front end was lowered. The car would run about 150 miles an hour. So what, what would you take? I mean, you've got no room for luggage. You want to ride for what oh, would you you're, I mean, you've got a bag, you've got some water. My mother very carefully packed fruit juices and vitamin C, stacks of $1 bills, and some stuff. Chocolate? Chocolate, well. Why do you have so much chocolate? Energy. I mean, 36 hours of nonstop, full attention driving is, is a serious endurance test. Yeah. Not only on the car, but on the drivers. I can imagine. Dude, can I drive it? Yeah, we can drive it. Come on, let's go. I'm ready. Many believe that the Cannonball Run became one of the most glamorous and exciting demonstrations of the 70s. It was named after Cannonball Baker, who set a record in 1933 for driving across the USA in 53 hours. Driving as fast as they could get away with, the Cannonballers of 71 aimed to do it in just 36 hours. So you did the first one? I did the first one. How old were you? 14. 14 years old? I was a navigator. There were supposed to be more cars, but they all dropped out the last minute, and then everybody found out how much fun we had. So did someone win? Oh, sure. Brock and Dan Gurney in a uh, uh, Ferrari Daytona won in fall of 71 in 35 hours, which was pretty quick. 35 hours, eh? Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah, you know, Dan Gurney was uh, uh, interviewed at the, the, the finish line, and he said, well, I never went over 175. The Cannonballers claimed the biggest accident they ever had involved a spilt lasagna. Brock's taking me to meet a couple of veterans of the race. What car did you drive? I had a Lotus Esprit S1. Oh, wow. So it was That's fun. a nice car. It was. We sold all our cars, pulled our money together. I took out a personal loan. And <laughs> the car was like $17,000, which is a lot of money. Yeah. What was your concentration of fuel? I mean, you know, Brock, I think, ate a lot of chocolate and fruits and vitamin C. And what, what, what might have been yours? But we got down to maybe 10 minutes at the, uh, at the wheel, stint, and then get out, change okay. over. We had cruise control in the car. And the co-driver could set the speed. I go, OK, give me 106 miles an hour. Uh, I'm a little tired. We take it down 105. OK, right. that's good. Yeah. Well, most of the cars had CBs. Mm -hmm. Did you use yours? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, all uh, the time. All the time? You had to apologize to the truckers. We're the car coming up behind you with the white lights. Uh, we're right. going to blow past your left doors if you'll let us. You know, we're really asking mm -hmm. permission to go by this, because they own the road. All right, OK. When we were crossing the Ohio border, there was a plane police car sitting off to the side with the lights off. Yeah. And he comes over on a CB, he goes, Blue Lotus, and I ignore him. And he goes, Blue Lotus, I ignore him again. So finally, at the third time, I said, yes. He goes, are you number three? <laughs> and I said, number three in what? And he goes, Cannonball. And I'm like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> when we were going into New Mexico, I remember thinking, God, we're getting away with this. Because, really, it's, a, it's an act of civil disobedience. 
So, but we we never got stopped. I never got we never got a speeding ticket. Wow. The cannonball protests failed to prevent the introduction of the 55 speed limit. It was the 70s oil crisis and the need to save fuel that finally ushered in the new speed limit. What's your handle? You got the silver bullet. Come back. Silver bullet. This is Blackbird. I'm in a 56 T-Bird. Uh, can I join up with you guys? You're always welcome. See if he can stay with us, huh? So we're going to get into a cannonball run, huh? Yeah. Oh! Hey, what is that sexy car coming down the road? Can I hop in that seat? Ah, uh, sure. We'll give you a ride. Well, you know, I don't get in cars unless I know the gentleman's name. Ah, uh, this is Seven Wallace and Silver Bullet. You'll be safe. We got ourselves a convoy. <laughs> All right, pedal fast. Let's go. When your dad started to cannibal, did you think it was going to grow as big as it did? When it cannibal happened, I mean, it, yes, it was a lark, yes, it was stupid, yes, it was all kinds of things, but it captured the American imagination. Right. I mean, there hasn't been a cannibal for 30 years, but it's still, that's what people think about. Yeah. Anytime that somebody's out having fun with their car, driving quickly, it's the cannibal. Cannonballers drove from coast to coast in the first ever supercars. It's the world of Starsky and Hutch, Dukes of Hazard, Smokey and the Bandit. This nation helped the car become a global star in its own right. I'm back in the UK again to test drive a street legal car that is close to my heart. It's a national icon familiar to millions and the car I learned to drive in at the age of 14. We may not have the underground heritage of Japan and the US, but there's one thing us Brits cherish, the Mini. The Mini for me is it's a sign of my liberation, right? I saved up some money and I bought a car and I drove it to school every day and it was a Mini Clubman. To buy a car at 14, one must have facial hair, OK? Because when you have facial hair at 14, people don't question your age. I'm not proud of my early exploits, but for me, it's where it all began. It was definitely the moment for me where I was like, right, I've got a little freedom, you know? I could drive anywhere I wanted, you know? It was amazing. Before the Mini came along, family cars were cumbersome, to say the least. So Alec Isigonis's revolutionary design changed all that. We've got to make a car, a very small car, for the housewife. Its small size made it great around town and surprisingly versatile on a rally stage. To everyone's surprise, it was a Mini that won the 1964 Monte Carlo rally with an Irishman at the wheel, Paddy Hopkirk. You were massively, like, successful and, you know, people knew who you were, you know what I mean? How, what was that like driving for your country and sort of, you know? Well, I think not many people went to Monte Carlo in those days. And I started from Russia, so it got the press imagination. Yeah. And then it was a surprise when we were against a lot more competitive cars, Mercedes of Germany, people with much bigger budgets. So we surprised ourselves <laughs> and the world by winning it with a little nurse's district nurse's car called the mini yeah. the mini was designed as a cheap family car and then john cooper put a little formula junior engine in it and they did it as a souped up model really right. the cooper that was the mini cooper what was it about front wheel drives that had an advantage over other rally cars do you think well front wheel drive <clears throat> in those days was quite a unique putting the engine sideways for a start uh, got the engine right over the driving wheels so everything was on the front, and what the back did didn't really matter too much. Its front-wheel drive technology was game-changing at the time. You ready, boss? Yes, boss. My co-driver. Just brings it all back. How bloody uncomfortable it was. <laughs> Paddy was probably one of the first personalities to come from rally driving. Woo! 
I'm learning from you. <laughs> Don't do what I do, just do what I say. <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. This guy's 80 years old. 80 years old. He's whipping that car. It's amazing. And now I get to drive. Did you film me trying to get in? <laughs> I loved rally driving, man. When I was a kid, I loved it. The Mini's been stupidly successful as a rally car, uh, which is what, what makes this really, really exciting. Hey, the police are behind us. Pulling tire, let's go. We've got the goals. Let's see it. Let's see it. Let's go. 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 let us go this is as basic as it gets. Thanks, thanks, thank you for this one, Very good in there. Whoops, whoa! Did you just scream? <laughs> I think I heard you scream. No, 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 no. <laughs> keep, keep the left here. Left, 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 left. Break, break. Very good, very good. That's much quicker than me. <laughs> I'm no Paddy Hopkirk, but this is wicked. Perfect. It's just like bombing around the old streets of East London all over again. <laughs> As they say in, in Ireland, you, you drive well. <laughs> oh. Yes, all this man in that small car. You, 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 it's gone. You, you. <laughs> it's good, and Paddy was giving me lots of good pointers there. I can see how difficult it is to drive that darn thing. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to see how he gets on in the in the proper cars now, that you enjoy it. The Mini's design remained unchanged for decades. That was until this came along, the Mini Metro. The Metro was built in an era when rallying got a little out of hand. These days, top rally cars pack a very powerful punch, 400 horsepower. In an effort to boost the spectacle of rallying, in 1982, the top tier was divided into two classes, Group A for modified road cars and Group B for prototype cars, with virtually no restrictions on power. New Audi Quattro Sport takes a lot of power. The new class started an arms race for ever more powerful machines. Four people killed, 31 injured. I am not prepared to go on as a driver, irrespective. No way. I'm not going. A spate of driver and spectator deaths finally forced the governing body to act, and Group B was banned in 1987. One of the world's top rally drivers, Henry Toivonen of Finland, has been killed. The car hit a rock and burst into flames. To show me how the humble Mini grew into a Group B monster, is someone who survived the experience. The winner of the 1986 Circuit of Ireland Rally. Di Llewellyn. How will you celebrate tonight? Plenty of Guinness. <laughs> and a couple of these young ladies, I think. <laughs> now this, is it really called a Mini or is it is a Metro? Well, it's, it's, it? it's a Mini Metro 6R4, we called it in rally terms. And basically because it's six cylinders and four wheel drive. So basically, Group B was a Frankenstein car. You could do what you want, right? <laughs> <laughs> you could just... Bolt yes. it together and, and race it. If you built 200 of them, you, you could, could go. basically go rallying with it. And what made this one so fast? Well, when you put 400 horsepower in a Mini, <laughs> make it as light as possible, right. it's going to go fast, it's isn't it? Go, yeah. 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 I wasn't expecting this. Pure acceleration. G-forces around the corners. This was an era where advances like four-wheel drive and better brakes meant that speed took on a whole new meaning. Now I can see why they banned Group B cars. They were wild days, weren't they? Jesus Christ. Hey, sir. <laughs> Dude. It was very quiet. Wow. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, She's a wicked God. girl, isn't she? She's a wild boy, this one. <laughs> Give it a bit of throttle to get going. That's it. OK, break. 
good. Power, power. Oh, yeah. Hey! <laughs> wow. <laughs> she will bite you. I told you she'd bite. The sheer power of this motor combined with the primitive technology makes it almost impossible for me to control. Good. Break on. Off the clutch, off your... Uh, you put your foot on the clutch. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Try it again. No. Second, off the clutch. Turn in. Power, power. Yes, yes. Whoa, nearly, nearly. Now you nearly had it that time. You have to work a bit, don't you? Yeah. Bit of power, bit of power, bit of power, bit of power. That's it. Hey, <laughs> we had it, boy. <laughs> Good experience for you. Oh, man. Yeah. Imagine doing 600 miles in that. No, can you imagine? <laughs> You'd be fit, your arms would be like... <laughs> that was difficult. It was very difficult. That was very good. I have to say, uh, for somebody to get into a car, of that, of that nature, and drive it that well was pretty good. I don't know, man. That's was... no makeup. <laughs> That's real That's sweat. Makeup. <laughs> <laughs> and tears all at once. After just one full season of competition, the Metro 6R4 was banned along with the other Group B cars. We had to wait till 2001 for the country's favorite car, now owned by the BMW Group, to return to the world of rallying. The modern Mini is once more one of the world's most iconic rally cars, and taking me for a ride in this one is Louise Cook. But you won a championship, didn't you? Yeah, I was the first female last year to win an FIA rally title, so I'm really pleased with that. That's yeah. brilliant. That's brilliant. Louise started at 19, and last year she won the WRC Production Cup. In a Rover 2000 is Anne Hall. Good Female night. rally drivers have been around since the 30s. Pat Moss and Elizabeth Nystrom have won first place for cars with all women. And Louise is leading the next generation. So this is your modern world rally car now. Obviously there's almost 30 years between this and, and the 6R4. Time for this girl racer from Kent to show the men what she can do. Finally, I get to drive the modern Mini. Now brake, that's it, brake. Sit, flip it, and now control the slide, that's it. He's got the feel and the balance of the car straight away, so yeah, it's quite impressive, I must say. After driving that 6R4, this feels so much easier. Mercifully, this track has plenty of room for the odd mistake. With modern gears, brakes and steering, this motor is fun to drive and easy to get the best out of. I could drive this all day. Well, it's a tremendous experience, isn't it? Driving these three cars over that period. You know, you're talking about cars of 40 years worth of rallying, aren't you? Oh. Yeah, man. For my next adventure, I'm going to uncover why the Finns have more rally champions per head than anywhere else. I'll hang out with rally driving legend Ari Vatanen. He said he wouldn't mention This is part of it. Yeah, but this is part of it. But you're mentioning it now. He said he wouldn't. And I will achieve a secret ambition. I'm going to drive a full powered rally car. I have to calm down now, you know, to have a calm attitude. Otherwise, really, we'll go off.